Now, I want you to know what happens here in these days is that we need to be very sensitive to God's Holy Spirit. And I happen to be preaching about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And today, I want to talk about, and this will likely be my last message in this series. See, the, the seeing my shadow on, on Groundhog Day did not give you six more weeks of this sermon series, okay? But, but uh, what we did see is that in, in the Scripture... The Apostle Paul is one who gives us strong teaching about the, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Now, folks, God's Holy Spirit has always been here. He was there in creation. He was always uh, visiting people throughout the Old Testament in times of, of mighty power. And he would, uh, you know, show up at the tabernacle and in the, you know, uh, fire by night and the cloud by day. It was just amazing that the presence of God's Spirit has always been working. But let me tell you someplace he wants to work most, the church. Because we are the, the place right now that have the responsibility of taking the gospel to the world. So if we are to understand things properly about the work of the Holy Spirit, we need to find out how does he work in the church? Well, he works in the church through you and 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 you. He works through people. And it's so vitally important that we not miss what God has for us and where we fit in his plan. And so as we look at this today, I'm going to talk about how, what it is to walk in the Spirit. I thought there was a, a slide that was going to talk about my sermon there. Uh, oh, those are things to pray for, by the way, <laughs> that you just saw. <laughs> but nevertheless, when we, when we talk about the idea of walking in the Spirit, the Apostle Paul deals with that in Galatians chapter 5, and then we'll, we'll visit how that really lives out in the church in Ephesians chapter 5. And so as we begin here, begin with me at verse 13. Now I have, um, it's not on the slide, but I have it on uh, Galatians 5, 16 and 25. They're the primary verses in the overall passage that I'll read here from Galatians. Listen to it closely. Beginning in verse 13 of, of Galatians 5. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not let it turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed of one another. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that those two are in opposition one to another so that you may not do the things that you please but if you are led by the spirit you're not under the law now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality impurity sensuality idolatry sorcery enmity strife jealousy outbursts angers uh, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, and factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I warn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to know, everybody here has done one or two or maybe several of those things. But it's talking about people who live in that and who practice that as their lifestyle. And he says, that's an evidence that they are not saved. Okay? The works of the flesh being the thing that, that is lived out every day of your life, that is indeed a mark that you are not a child of God. But look at verse 22 uh, and following. But. Now, You've had a couple of those little conjunctions earlier. One of them was talking about the works of the law, and he says, but you're set free in Christ. And then it was talking about the works of the flesh, and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit. Every time you see that little conjunction, but, everything changes about what's just been said to where you're going. And so here he says, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now, folks, this is how we're supposed to live, this verse. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against, against such things there's no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, and envying one another. Listen to me on this. He is giving them warnings about something they're doing. Folks, if that's true of you in your life, God's giving you a warning. Not to, uh, to allow those things in your life, but to have them crucified to Christ and then to be filled with the Spirit. And he's talking then about, uh, you know, walking in the Spirit. Now, when that word walk is used there, it's not talking about putting one foot in front of the other and making it down the way. No, no, it's talking about a lifestyle. He's talking about living a lifestyle that is in sync with God's Holy Spirit. And so when he says, walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He is telling you, you don't want to do these things, then walk in the Spirit. So how do we walk in the Spirit? Well, the Apostle Paul makes it real clear, and by the way, many of his letters were oftentimes circulated, okay? And so Galatians and, uh, Galatia and Ephesian, uh, Ephesus and, you know, different towns like that were close to one another. Colossae, they were close to one another, so they might have a letter written to them, and they say, Man, you, you need to hear what the Apostle Paul sent to us. And so they go over and they share it with another church. And they say, well, here's what he wrote to us. Well, these two would be sharing this back and forth. And they would find out that they're to walk in the Spirit. And then the people in Ephesus might say, yeah, he talked about that. Let's, talk, let's read that part. Well, let me take you to the other letter. Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll see where he is indeed talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to back you up a little bit in this passage, or break into the passage here. And in verse 15, he says, Therefore, be careful how, to walk, how you walk. Okay, what did we say that was? Your lifestyle. Okay? Be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Now, when it says making the most of your time, uh, there, there's, it's, it's interpreted another way in some of the other versions of the Scripture, but it's the idea of grabbing a bargain. Have, have you all been to one of the, like a Walmart or someplace where they have a blue light special, and they say in such and such a department there's a blue light special going on? People will just start converging upon that spot to try to find out, can I get the deal? Okay. He's saying time is like that. It's a commodity that you better learn how to use properly. Don't waste it. Invest it. Find out how that God wants you to, to walk in this life. He says, making the most of your time because the days of evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How many of y'all have ever prayed for the will of the Lord? I have. I pray for it regularly. But when, it, when we think about praying for the will of the Lord, sometimes it's obscure. We don't have a, a clear picture of what it is we're wanting to see God show us. But Paul defines that picture in high definition. He helps you to see what the will of the Lord is. So as you see him closing out verse 17, where he says, so then, uh, uh, excuse me, yeah, verse 17, he says, understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, let me stop right there for just a moment. When he talks about not getting, being drunk with wine, he says that's because of excess. You know, when you take in too much of that, it begins to do some things to you. Have you ever noticed someone who is under the control of wine or, you know, alcohol or whatever, and as they are under that control of that, they begin to lose their ability to, to talk real well, and they don't walk as, as good as they used to, and, and things just change because something else is in control of them. They might see strange things, you know, say strange things, all of those things. Why? Because the alcohol is in control. So he is using a Jewish way of, of contrast to make, a, make his point here. 
He said, just like wine controls a person and it controls your walk, the Holy Spirit can control a person and he can control your walk. And so as you see this, he says in verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now when it says but, be filled with the Spirit, remember I said there's that cosmic conjunction, but be filled with the Spirit. That's his point. He's not really bearing down on the wine issue or anything like that. Not, you know, I don't you know, think you ought to be a person who gets drunk with wine. I think the Bible's real clear about that. But folks, his point is not that. His point is, be filled with the Spirit. And here's what it looks like. Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. How do you do that? You just did it. Okay? You just did it in the house of the Lord. When we come together and we sing His praises, when we sing with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, you'll find that many of the songs we sing have a scriptural background in them. They help you to see things that are taught in the psalms or in, you know, in other places in the scripture. I love songs that are scripturally based. And by the way, on Wednesday nights, I'm now uh, doing some teaching, and I'm going to be talking about Baptist distinctives, what the Bible uh, uh, is, is des- describing for us about, you know, how to be saved, how to know, sh- know for sure you are saved, how to do evangelism, all different kinds of things. We'll be talking about that on Wednesday nights as we're meeting together. And one of the things I like to do is I like to sing Scripture. So I'm going to bring some song sheets where all of us have the same words. You know, in here, when you bring your Bible, uh, you, you know, you might have an NIV and you might have an ESV and you might have a KJV and you might, you know, all these different versions and they don't read the same. So I, I always put the words on one sheet where everybody's singing the same words to the song. But you know what it does for you? It lets you take the scripture into you. And you say, well, I can't memorize scripture. You sing it enough and you can. Okay, it, It'll just start coming out of you like a melody. <laughs> and so when we, when we meet together on Wednesday nights, that's one of the things we'll do. And we'll pray. And we'll look at those very important things from the Scripture that really are very distinctive to we as a Baptist people. Now, I'm not talking about Baptist doctrine. I'm talking about Bible doctrine. But there are some things that very distinctively uh, identify Baptist people. And I'll talk about those things and not braggadociously or anything like that. I just want us to see what the Bible says and why we believe what we believe. Okay, so that's what we're doing. But nevertheless, in this passage, he says, uh, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, sometimes you can sing the words and not get it in your heart. You know that? But I don't know about you. I want those words in my heart. I've I've oftentimes been working out on my farm and I be all day on the tractor brush hogging or something. I am wanting the songs to come to my mind while I'm sitting out there listening to that tractor roar. Okay. I I, I really want to sing the songs of my faith and let my heart worship. Can you do that on tractor seat? Yeah, you can. Okay. You can do it just about anywhere, but I want you to understand it's vitally important that when we are are filled with the Spirit, that worship is a natural byproduct of that. And then what you'll see is he he says, uh, not only singing, make a melody in your heart to the Lord, he says, and always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. What is another mark of being filled with the Spirit? Thankfulness. Thankfulness. Susan, one time I heard Dr. Adrian Rogers say that he saw two different kinds of people in the church. He saw those that were uh, humbly grateful and those that were grumbly hateful. (laughs) Now, I want you to know that when you think about that, you can tell the difference about who's filled with the Spirit. You find somebody who's grumbling and hateful and ugly and mean-spirited and all of that, I promise you that person is not filled with the Spirit. Promise you. 
okay? They are telling you, I am not filled with the Spirit. So what should be your response? Be filled with the Spirit. <laughs> Don't answer in kind. Okay, don't answer in the same way that they have spoken to you. But what you'll find there, he says, always giving thanks for all things. Does that say all good things? No. No. I'm, I'm real thankful for a chance to see my mother yesterday. My mother's in a memory care unit over in Neosho, Missouri, a nursing home over there, and she's no longer able to use her walker. They've hospice has put her in a wheelchair all the time. And, and yesterday, maybe for the first time, I wasn't sure if she knew me or she didn't. That's hard. But I thank God for my mama. Because that's not her. The her that I knew was a godly, prayerful, wonderful mother. And she still is. Okay? She's just being robbed of it for a little bit of time. But folks, when it's all over with, I'm thankful. And when the Lord takes her home, I'll be even more thankful right now. Because I don't want to see her in that condition for very long. But you see, as we look at these things, he says, giving thanks for all things, even when they're not good, even when they're hard, even wish you, when you wish it was something else, you be thankful to God. And then he says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, another version says, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Well, that's the whole idea of being filled with the Spirit is that, that we connect with other people. And sometimes you have a responsibility that puts you in charge, but sometimes they have one that puts them in charge. And we just need to honor whatever God has put in place. And we need to submit to one another in the fear of God. Now, Paul goes on to let them know that that works at home too. Because the very next verse, he says, Wives, submit to your husbands. Now, that has really fallen on hard times in our day. It's almost like I, you know, I, I'd be charged with a hate crime for saying those, those words. But let me tell you something. That doesn't change anything. God still has an order. And God still wants us to obey His divine order. Because it is His protection. I tell you, it, when... When I do premarital counseling, one of the things I love to teach young couples is what I call the umbrellas of authority. And I draw some umbrellas on a page, just the arc of an umbrella. And I say, okay, at the top, this is God. This one is the husband. This one is the wife. This one is for the children. I said, now, if Satan comes to try to come after you and you were in right place in your authority structure, he has to go through God to get to the husband. He has to go through God and the husband to get to the wife. He has to go through God, the husband, and the wife to get to the children. But at any point in time where a child says, I'm not going to obey my parents, I'm going to do my own thing, they are a direct shot for Satan. Same thing for a wife, ladies. Okay? And husbands, you better lead your family to be under God. Okay? So he talks about being filled with the Spirit. And then he says, wives, submit to your husbands. And then he says later in this passage, husbands, love your wife. Now, hear me and hear me well. We relate to one another very differently, men and women. Okay? Because later, Paul will, will close out this passage saying, uh, you know, I, I'm speaking concerning Christ in the church, but he says, nevertheless, let the husband love his wife and the wife respect her husband. Respect? Yeah, yeah. Some versions call it reverence, but it's the idea of respect. Why, why is that, that God commands the husband to love and the wife to submit? Well, because for the wife, submitting is the hardest thing for her to do. So she must be filled with the Spirit to do it. For the husband, 
His is, you know, he looks at everything in black and white functional terms and, you know, oftentimes is not a, an emotional person at all. And so God says, husbands love. And you say, well, I, I'm not a real touchy-feely, lovey kind of guy. So, husbands love. How do you do it? Be filled with the Spirit. You see, God is calling upon us to fulfill our roles by being led by the Holy Spirit, and to be filled with the Spirit is to fulfill those roles. And children, how do you obey your parents? Be filled with the Spirit. Become a child of God, and then let the Spirit of God lead you. God can lead children, okay? And so that's a very wonderful place when the family understands that God works in this. But he doesn't stop there. Paul keeps on going, and it flows over in uh, the, the sixth chapter, where he says, and servants, obey your masters. You see, there's another realm of authority. Now, we don't have slaves and masters and all that kind of stuff in our society. Thank God there, there's some illicit kinds of things like that going on, and that needs to be stopped, okay? But nevertheless, that's not common. But what is common is you have a job. You have a boss. And you say, well, I don't like the way he says things. He's the boss. She's the boss. Listen to them. Because as you do, you will find a much better place in walking in the Spirit. So how does the Holy Spirit apply to all of these things? Well, if you're filled with the Spirit, it's going to show up in your life in love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance and self-control. You know, those nine fruits of the Spirit that he mentions there, those are just characteristics that start showing up in your life. You say, I'm not a very good lover. Be filled with the Spirit. Learn to love. Okay? So, you know, there's people I'm not real crazy about. You know, they, they might have a different skin color than me, or they might speak a different language, or yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever your hang-up is, get filled with the Spirit and get over it. Okay? <laughs> really. Because when we, when we are filled with the Spirit, we learn to walk. We learn to have a lifestyle, one that's pleasing to God and appealing to others. When someone loves you, does that repulse you? No. You're glad they love you. If someone shows joy, do you like to be around them? Yes, you do. Okay? Someone has self-control. Is it evident? Yeah. They, I mean, they're, they're not doing stupid things. Okay? Because they're filled with the Spirit. So as you look at these things, it's so intensely practical. God wants His people to walk in the Spirit. And he doesn't leave you wondering what that means. So what does it mean, be filled with the Spirit? Does it mean that we have a, a mystical experience and everything is wild and crazy? And our, you know, No. No, being filled with the Spirit is a very practical thing. Being filled with the Spirit is simply emptying yourself of sin and self and say, Lord, fill me up. And take control. You know, when we, when we think about it, it's, it's as though when we're filled with the Spirit, we don't have to make all the decisions anymore. Some of them are already made. We, we just already see in the Scripture some things that God wants, some things that He doesn't want. And it makes life a little simpler. But man, if you're all over the map deciding, I like this, I don't like that, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try... <laughs> Be filled with the Spirit. Submit to God's Word. Understand what He says. Live free. Okay? Live free. God never puts restrictions on things that are good for you. Okay? He puts restrictions on things that will harm you. And so when we look at that, if God puts a restriction on something, thank Him for it and say, I'll, I'll, I'll follow that instruction, Lord. So when we are filled with the Spirit, we're obeying the Word of God, and, and what else did we say? We sing with one another. Where does that happen? In church. You ought to be in church if you're filled with the Spirit. Okay? You really should. 
You ought to be submissive to those who are leading your congregation. Right now, I have the responsibility of giving leadership to this congregation until your permanent pastor comes, but you've given me that privilege of standing as your interim pastor. So listen to what's being taught. Find out how that you plug it in in your life. Learn what it really means to have a lifestyle of being uh, uh, filled with the Spirit. And when it says be filled with the Spirit, literally in the original language, in the Greek, as Paul is writing it to them. And by the way, if you don't know, the, the New Testament is primarily written in Koine Greek. That's not classical Greek like you see today. It was something that was very common in the day of Jesus and his apostles, but when the Romans came in, they, they shut it down, and they said, We're, you're not going to speak that language anymore. So that did a couple of things. One, it caused everybody to have to scatter to learn how to speak Latin and all of the different things that were a part of the Roman Empire, but it sealed that language from change. So when you see what it says in the Koine Greek, what it meant then is what it means now. God did an amazing thing. But when we look at that, that in in the Greek language, when it says be filled with the Spirit, it literally says be being filled with with His Spirit. So not just get it one time and you're done. No, no, no. Folks, that happens in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Everybody who is a child of God is baptized in the Holy Spirit. But understand this. The filling of the Spirit happens over and over and over and over again. Diane and I pray each and every Sunday morning before I step up here. I pray that God would cleanse me of any sin. And that I would be filled with His Spirit. And then she says, Lord, direct His words. Make them be the words that people need to hear today now folks I got a couple of pages of notes here didn't even look at them because God's word gives you clear enough instruction so I I believe whatever came today as extemporaneous as it is was for your benefit not because of me because of him because when we're filled with the spirit We are under his control. So you be being filled with the Spirit. That's not just for Sundays, folks. That's for Mondays and Fridays and Wednesdays and every day in between there is for us to be controlled by God's Spirit. And when you're controlled by the Spirit, it doesn't matter if you're a school teacher or if you're, you know, a a truck driver. God bless our truck drivers. Amen. (laughs) But whatever it is, you need to be filled with the Spirit. It will show up in your life. And so as we think about this today, we need to ask the Lord to help us walk in the Spirit so that we can stop falling back into the ways of the flesh. Now, if you've got besetting sins, things that just keep coming up, take them to Christ and let Him nail them to His cross. That's what it says in Colossians 2.15, that he's taken our sin out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So we need to learn how to appropriate what God's word says and live it out. It's not theory. It's practice. And so I call you to practice the word of God. But maybe you're here today and you've never come to faith in Christ. Well, I want you to know that's the starting place. And until you have received Christ, none of this really can be applied in your life. Wouldn't you like to have love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness and faith and self-control and all of those things that are available to the child of God? They're not available to you if you're not a child of God. Because you are trapped in sin. The good news is Jesus came He paid the penalty of our sin and rose on the third day so that we could have victory over sin ourselves. God wants that for you. And today, if you need to know Christ, I'd love to share with you how you could receive Christ into your heart. I'll be waiting here at the front. Or if you need to come and pray for any other reason, these altars are always open. I want the altar to be a welcoming place 
for the people of God. Would you bow together with me as we pray? Thank you, Lord, for the chance to speak to your people today. Thank you for your word and for how it really helps us get on target. Lord, I pray now that you will take those things you've spoken to our hearts, drive them deep in, and make us willing to follow you in every step of our life. Help us, Lord, to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Stand together with me, please.